I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you how honored and proud I am to be here tonight to mark half a century of Canada in space. I was invited a couple of years ago to give a talk in Chicago at a space conference there. And it was a fairly big event. There were, I don't know, seven or 800 people in this big ballroom. And I got up and I said, uh, hello, I come from a little country just north of here. Uh, we don't have a lot of people, but we have a lot of land. And uh, I just wanted to remind you that we were the third country in space. And the whole room kind of went, oh, oh, oh really? Oh, 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 that's interesting. I said, yes. The Soviet Union was first with Sputnik in 1957. You in the United States were second with Explorer 1 in 1958. And Canada was third with Alouette 1 in 1962. And I said it like that. And the whole room went, ooh, oh, I didn't know that was really good. And I said, and both Sputnik and Explorer 1 have fallen out of their orbits and burned up in the atmosphere, but Alouette 1 is still up there. And they all went, whoa. Ah, ah. And I said, when Canada puts something up, it stays up. We're very pleased to bring you this special video edition of the Star Spot, the Astronomy and Space Exploration Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Trottier. The Star Spot had the privilege of being invited to cover the 50 year anniversary celebration of the launch of Alouette 1, Canada's first space satellite. The Alouette was of tremendous importance in the history of Canadian space exploration, and the scientists and engineers who were behind the design of Alouette 1, the real pioneers of the Canadian space age, were the honored guests at the Canadian Aviation and Space Museum on September 29th, 2012. You've heard a lot tonight about how it, the satellite, uh, the program was the, allowed Canada to become the third nation to have its own satellite built and put into space. You've heard stories over the years and probably stories here tonight about the technical problems that Alouette had to solve. As Colin Franklin uh, very eloquently puts it, there were no textbooks. We wrote the textbooks as we went along. And this is how the Canadian Space Program started. The Alouette 1 project was pivotal, not just to the success of the Canadian Space Program, but to launching it in the first place. And it was embarked upon, not because it was easy, but because it was hard. The MC for the 50th anniversary celebration of the Alouette 1 launch, Bob McDonald, is a man who understands the value of opportunities that come from rising to a challenge. The most popular science journalist in Canada and the host of CBC's Quirks and Quarks that draws half a million listeners each week, Bob McDonald is the recipient of a variety of awards, including the 2005 McNeil Medal for the Public Awareness of Science from the Royal Society of Canada, the university dropout with six honorary doctoral degrees to his credit, sat down with me at the Star Spot to discuss how opportunities have shaped his own life, the value of storytelling and selling science and his experiences on the CBC. Oh, okay. Thank you, Bob McDonald, for joining us at the My Star pleasure. Spot. Um, we'll get into the nature of the event tonight momentarily, but I want to ask you first about your background, because you're Canada's premier science journalist. Well, and I'm, I'm a, one science journalist. In you Canada. are one of the premier, I think, Canadian science journalists. But your background, you don't have a science background, like an academic background. How did you get into this? Well. Uh, my interest in space started when I was a kid because I grew up in the space age. <clears throat> the entire space program has happened within my lifetime. I remember Sputnik. I'm almost as old as these guys are. <laughs> Not quite. And so that was a very exciting time. And uh, my mother came home one day from shopping and gave me this picture book. It was actually drawings of the planets. And uh, because we didn't know what the planets looked like because we hadn't been there yet. But when I looked at this, the artist brought me to Mars and brought me to Jupiter and brought me to all these worlds. And I realized as a kid when I was seven or eight years old that there are other places out there that are just as real as this place, mm. but very, very different. Other worlds out there. Other planets, other worlds. And the space program was happening and we were going to go to the moon. And I thought maybe when I grew up and, and started dyeing my hair gray and living in the 21st century that I might be there one day. Uh, it didn't quite happen that way. <laughs> But that was what got me interested in, in space, because ever since I was a kid, I knew about the planets and, and found them very fascinating. But I wasn't very good 
in school. I goofed around too much. Um, I was your uh, class clown, and I did a lot of theater, which helps me now, actually. Uh, so I, in high school, I got the lead in Oklahoma, and so I was a song and dance man. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a Midsummer Night's Dream in university and a bunch of stuff like that. So I really liked performing, but I wasn't really all that interested in academics. So after second year of university, I dropped out mm -hmm. and worked construction. Didn't know what I wanted to do with it. Were myself. you studying anything science related I was studying for that first year? English and philosophy. Okay. But I took astronomy as a side course, ah. and that was the most interesting course, and the one that I did the best in. Gotcha. But I wasn't very good at the math. Uh, I'm, I'm I blame it on being left-handed. Okay. See, we're, we're in our right minds, but the math is over in your left brain. So Hard to integrate I, the two. I blame it on that. So um, I thought I was going to be a construction worker for the rest of my life, because uh, I don't have role models in my family. Uh, both my parents were uneducated and didn't have a lot of money. But I had an opportunity that came along in 1973 when my girlfriend at the time was working at the Ontario Science Centre in Toronto. And she tipped me off. She said, they're looking for people to do the shows that stand hair up with static electricity. Your theatre background came in. My theatre background and my interest in science all came together. Interesting. And I basically talked myself into that job. Uh, I managed to catch the boss who was hiring people on the day he had just come back from vacation and he hadn't had a chance to read any of the applications yet. So he didn't know that I wasn't a, a science graduate. But I was so anxious to work there, uh, he said, you're the kind of person we want to have here and he hired me on the spot. And that just started my whole science communication career. You've really taken advantage of opportunities you that bet. have come your way. And I've seen some of your, you've gotten six honorary doctorates and yeah. you've given a number of commencement speeches in that context. I saw one that you gave at Laurentian, and you were talking a lot about opportunities, and I guess that's one of the big ones for you. How do you know an opportunity when you see it? Oh, we all see opportunities. We all see opportunities. It's usually just a conversation from a friend or, or a colleague or somebody will say, hey, you know, like happened to me, did, did you know that uh, Quirks and Quarks is looking for a host? <laughs> and whenever you hear an opportunity like that, our first reaction is to say, oh, I can't do that. You, you can come up with a million reasons why not to do it. I don't know where it came from, but I've developed a, a bad habit of saying yes when opportunities come along, even though I'm not actually qualified to do it. And I have found that when you do that, you get really, really scared, but you learn really fast when you're scared. And uh, people are willing to help, too, if you ask. So if you push yourself a little bit, it's amazing where it'll go. And that, that's the story of my life. I've just had opportunities that come along. And you recognize an opportunity when it's something that you say to yourself, gee, I'd really like to do that. Mm. Or, or it's your childhood dreams. You follow your dreams. You know? One of those for you certainly was Quirks and Quarks, but you were already working for CBC, and then with Quirks and Quarks, you, you, you were on that show since, I think, 1992. And I think it's been described as the longest lasting uh, science show, at least in Canada, science broadcast show in Canada. Why, why do you think it had that longevity, that appeal? In, in the world. In the world. In the world. There's only one other show. I appreciate show. that correction. That's there's an only, important one. <laughs> there's only one other science show that's been on longer than Quirks and Quarks, which is now 37 years we've been on the air. And it's a show that comes out of Australia. It's called The Science Show. <laughs> and a good friend of mine and colleague, Robin Williams, has been the host of that show for two months longer than Quirks and Quarks <laughs> has been on the air. And he always rubs that in <laughs> so that he's the longest uh, in, in the world. We're number two behind him. But yes. Quirks and Quarks has been on the air, and its ratings have never fallen. Have never fallen. They've always been consistent. Um, half a million people, another couple of hundred thousand on uh, podcasts, and I think it shows that people are generally interested in science. And we do just science. That's all we do. We do pure science. What's happening that we didn't know before? What's the cutting edge of our knowledge? Which is why it's such a privilege to me to be on the show. I can't believe the people I talk to. I talk to people who win the Nobel Prize, or somebody who just discovered that you know, the, the universe is speeding up, or they just found some new gene that might lead to the cure to cancer, whatever. They're talking to me, an uneducated bum from a really Ontario. And I pinch myself every now and then and, and realize what a privilege it is for me to be there. And um, I hope the show continues. I mean, it's, it's a very small team. There's only four of us to work on the show. Oh, really? And, um, but we put it out every week and the CBC kind of leaves us alone because we keep bringing in international awards and uh, 
our audience is dedicated. So I'm, I'm kind of proud of that. As a science communicator and a science journalist, I'm always curious, how do you make science, or specifically astronomy or space in this case, how do you make it sort of sexy and appealing without watering down the substance, diluting the message? <clears throat> well, part of it is that because I'm not a PhD in science, I'm closer to the people who are listening. I'm closer to the audience. So I see myself as a translator between scientists who fundamentally speak another language and, and common English. So I have to translate that. And I've been in it long enough now that I can speak science, or I, at least I can understand it. So I'm always thinking images. I'm always thinking analogies. So if they're talking about how a drug needs to get into the surface of a cell and lock into a receptor, well, I'm thinking lock and key. Um, or I'm, I'm always thinking everyday objects to try to, to summarize things up. So when you're listening to me on quirks, whenever you hear me say, let me see if I got this right, that's me hurting. Okay, they just said something really complicated and it's too deep. So I got to pull back and try to spin it back to them in my own words in as few words as possible and, and simply as possible. So it's not watering down, it's not dummying down, it's clarifying. It's just making it really, really clear. Because in radio, you only hear it once. You don't have a picture to help you. Mm -hmm. you, you can't go back and read something again like you can right, in print. Right. You only hear it once. So we have to make sure that we're really, really clear. And it's the art of storytelling, really, because these people have stories to tell, just like these pioneers here tonight have stories to tell. And so we focus on that story. So when I'm talking to an astronomer, I'm not talking about everything in astronomy. I'm talking about their work on a black hole jet in the middle of our Milky Way galaxy. So it's very tightly focused. Okay, so I gotta set the stage, like in stories, there's gotta be a set. Where did it happen? Middle of our galaxy. Uh, or maybe it's the Serengeti Plains of Africa. Uh, great, then you have the character, you got the scientist. There, there I was on the Serengeti Plains. What were you doing there? I was studying lions, really. So there's, there's the, the, the uh, intent to be there. And then there's the action that happens. What happened? Well, I was coming around a bush and there was a lion on the other side. I didn't see it and I tripped over it. And, and the lion didn't see me and, and, and I screamed and the lion screamed and we both ran off in opposite directions. Wonderful story. There's the action, there's the tension. What are you gonna do next? Well, I wanna understand whether lions are in blah, 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 whatever. So it's all about telling a story. And telling a science story is no different than telling a fairy tale or telling a drama. You got a set, you got a character, you got action, and you got a, maybe a little bit of tension, and then what, what's gonna happen next? Gee, what's gonna happen next? So we structure our interviews on Quirks. I work very closely with the producers to, to decide what the story's gonna be before I even go into the interview. And I read the background material so I know what the story is. And we come up with a line of questions that will say, tell that, that story, that, that plot line. So I actually know the answers to all the questions I'm asking. And my job is listening. So this is what makes it easier for me. I, when I first started, I, I used to focus on my questions and I was worried about sounding stupid. And then I realized that if I'm thinking about myself, I'm not listening. And in normal conversation, that's not what you do. You listen to the other person and you respond to what they say. Exactly. Yeah, what'd you do today? I went to the dentist. Oh, really? What happened? You, know, <laughs> you follow on what they said. So I listen. It's conversational. That's correct. And, and if I ask a question, I'm trying to lead them into their story. If they're giving me that story, this is great. But if they wander off somewhere, I got to bring them back. Or if they get too complicated, I got to simplify it. And then I got to guide them through the story. So that's all it is, is storytelling. Let's talk about today's story. We're yeah. here celebrating the 50th anniversary of Alouette yeah. 1, Canada's first space satellite. Yeah. We were talking earlier about opportunities, and I wonder if there's a nice tie in there. When, when the idea of Alouette 1 was first proposed to these pioneers who are here in the, behind us right now, um, I mean, that was a huge opportunity for Canada. Oh, yeah, and absolutely. I'm sure there's a lot of reasons to say, no, it's too hard, we can't do this. Um, how important was it to take us, if you could take us back 50 years, I mean, how important was that opportunity for Canada as far as opening the, the space age for Canadians? Well, there's a couple of levels to that. Um, as an opportunity for Canada, it was an opportunity for us to show the rest of the world that we're smart, that we do great stuff here. Canada had already been doing great science in space and astronomy. We were launching out of Churchill. Uh, we had telescopes. We were, uh, we're still, we're still like number three in the world when it comes to astronomy in terms of the number of papers that we, we put out. 
but most of the world doesn't know that. And so this was an opportunity for us to say to the international stage, look at Canada and take us seriously. So I think that was, that was a real opportunity. What speaks to me about it is that it was a challenge. There was a deadline. They had to get this thing up quickly, and it was really, really hard to do. And it was interesting that Mac Evans was talking tonight about um, how Kennedy, the same year that Alouette went up, said, we're going to go to the moon. And part of that speech that he gave at Rice University, one of the lines that he gave, which I think was fabulous, he said, we're not doing this because it's easy, we're doing this because it's hard. Right. And when you take on something that's really, really hard, that's never been done before, which is what Alouette was, it pushes you beyond your limits and you, you innovate in ways that you never thought was possible. And I think if you, if you talk to these, these guys these, and these scientists, they'll tell you that. You know, we thought it was, we couldn't do it, but we got together and, and it forced them to work as a team. It forced them to cut the, the administrative crap and just get this thing done at all costs. And uh, they did it. And it's so great that the students that are here tonight with the design challenge is the same thing. It's a challenge. There's a two-year deadline. Get that thing built. And, and it really forces you to push it together. And I think that's a much better way to do things. The X Prize that uh, was to put the first private rocket in space, um, they've now branched that out to other areas for high mileage, for, for all kinds of things. You put up a challenge, you offer a prize, and then just leave it wide open. And let the people themselves push themselves and see what they can come up with, rather than think you can figure it all out ahead of time and say, here, do that. So I think challenges I know are great. you're a busy guy, and I'm sure you're tired. It's, it's been a long evening. Um, I just want to ask you one more question. We're here in the Canadian Aviation and Space Museum. There aren't a lot of institutionalized places for science education. I wonder if I get you to comment on how important you think museum, space museums are, planetariums, institutions like that, for providing an avenue uh, to communicate science to those stories to the public. Well, I think they're really important. And Canada has a lot of them. There's, there's this place, there's the National Museum of Science and Technology, the Ontario Science Centre, TELUS World of Science, uh, Edmonton Science Centre, their, their, uh, Halifax has one, the Maritime Museum there. The importance of these places, especially for young people, is to get them out of the classroom, get them torn away from their computers, and get them doing things, and get them meeting people like aviators and, and uh, the people who restore these planes, get to fly simulators, get to, get to do stuff and do hands-on experiences, which is really, really important. And also, again, appreciate that a lot of stuff has happened here. Look at how many of these planes are built here in Canada. Most people don't even know that half of these were done like that, including the Arrow, the, the Avro Arrow. That was it's, amazing to see part of that back Yeah, there, it's right? the only piece in existence that's left. Mm -hmm. It was going to be the world's fastest and highest flying airplane. Too bad it didn't, <laughs> it was cut. Some of the pioneers here today, in fact, it turns out, had worked, had on, worked on, on the Avro. And a lot of those, those engineers went to NASA to work on the Mercury yeah. and the, the Apollo programs. So I think the museums are, uh, are really important to uh, support for that reason, because it, it makes science real, both historically and contemporarily, because uh, all the science centers take different approaches to that. And it, it's really important. Our kids are, the education system to me is failing our kids. I, I judge science fairs sometimes, and I see kids that put up this really sexy display, but they cobble it together off the internet, or they got it from their parents, and they can tell me what's on the board, but when I start asking them fundamentals, they don't know basics. They don't know the fundamentals, they don't know the basics. And that really bothers me. There's this phrase, information rich, knowledge poor. Right. So the information is easy to get, but, but is it sinking in? Signal to noise yeah. ratio. So, so when you come to a place like this and you see the real things and you can walk among them and you can touch stuff and do things, that's knowledge. You, you learn by experiencing, not just by, by reading and being told. So we gotta support our museums. Paul McDonald, a real pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us My at the pleasure Star Spot. My pleasure speaking to you. My pleasure.